In 1993, the Unabomber reappears. He's been gone a long time, and he wants to make sure that everyone realizes he's back. And the FBI says that a letter bomb was mailed to the home of one of this country's foremost geneticists. He is in critical condition tonight in Northern California. It's a rather large shock. People had gotten used to the idea that the Unabomber would never be heard from again. And all of a sudden, he's not just back, but he is back in a big way. Dr. Epstein, a genetics researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, has made advances in the study of Down syndrome. And who can blame him? He lost his eardrums and fingers to this guy just because he was doing his job trying to help humanity. Investigators say they found no link between the attack and Epstein's work. As a reporter, I talked to Epstein, and uh, Dr. Epstein in particular was mad till the day he died, and I don't blame him one tiny bit. I think especially useful targets would be things like computer centers and, or, or let us say, for example, genetic engineering laboratories, because these are the sort of the cutting edge of the, the system's progress. Because I think a lot of people are, are threatened by things like genetic engineering or, or superimposing computers. The letter bomb went off at 8.30 this morning at Yale's Computer Science Center. 38-year-old associate professor David Glerter was opening his mail in his fifth floor office when the letter bomb exploded. So now you have two devices. One goes to a geneticist. The other goes to a computer science professor at Yale University. The historical significance of the case is not lost on people. There's been nothing like this in FBI history. The two attacks this week have raised fears that a serial bomber blamed for a dozen explosions in the late 70s and 80s may be back at work. Overnight, the decision is made to reinvigorate the investigation by putting a lot of resources into it. They're getting thousands of tips, nutcases, kind of nutcases, people you take somewhat seriously, and then ones who think, wow, maybe you got a point. It's exhausting. We're taking in so much information. What if something gets past us? That was the fear we live, we live with all the time, that the answer has come to us and we've passed it by. Man, now what has man done? Man can't stand himself for where he's told that he belongs. Don't understand Man blames everyone Everyone under the sun Tell me what is man to come Man can't help himself Don't know where he can run Man can't run for help Can't stand anybody else Local, state, and federal investigators continue to work around the clock, collecting evidence from the blast. I would imagine it would be uh, a relatively quick determination from residue that, uh, that we can tell what kind of explosive was involved. It's now using a chlorate mixture that he's created, which no longer requires a pipe to contain it, uh, so it explodes uh, on its own once it's initiated. In my case, they had um, DNA results that were called the DQ alpha reading, and this was from postage stamps that were on Unibond devices, and this supposedly would narrow it down to 3% of the population. In other words, 3% of the population would have the same DQ alpha reading. You know, that doesn't prove very much 3% of the population because there are millions of people who would fit into that. You know, one thing I've learned, to my surprise, is all this stuff is a lot less effective than people think. 
I mean, technology is useful if it's used intelligently, but if it's used by people who are incompetent, then it's not very effective. We have uh, an announcement of a piece of evidence in the case, which has never been made public before. The New York Times receives a letter from the Unabomber. Rather short, it's a, a double-spaced paragraph, not a lot of words, claiming credit for these bombings. Investigators at the time have hopes that it will provide some clues. So you have the typeface. What kind of typewriter wrote this? Where did the paper come from? Can you figure that out? Is the paper significant in some way? Where it was mailed, its type of stamps. Is there any DNA under the flap of the envelope? Are there any fingerprints on the paper or on the envelope? None of that. There's none of that. There's no good forensic evidence. But there is, on this letter, is indented writing. The sort of impressions which are created by writing on a surface with a piece of paper under that surface. So you've left uh, no ink marks or pencil marks, but you've left an indentation. Call Nathan R. Wednesday, 7 p.m. This is taken by the investigators as a mistake that the Unabomber has made. Finally, he has made a mistake. If uh, any members of the public uh, know a Nathan R. Uh, or have any uh, idea uh, as to who that person might be and in what context, uh, that information would be of critical importance for us. We were looking for Nathan R.'s everywhere. It was uh, crazy. All the task force has to do is find every single one of them and one of them will know who the Unabomber is because he's going to receive a phone call on Wednesday at 7 p.m. How hard can this be, right? Well, it's tremendously hard. Um, there are a lot of people named Nathan R. So you go calling and you, you know, you've, you've chased down 15 different ways of getting to an Nathan R. Finally knock on the door and the guy says, you know, who are you? I don't care, get lost. It's, it, there's a lot of that when you're doing a story like this. Every Nathan R that they could find, and there are thousands of them, we had them all interviewed to ask these questions. It didn't lead to a solution. There's a sense that he's fooling them. He's eluding them. He's toying with them and taunting them. The pressure that the task force is under uh, is increased by these taunts. Right over there was Ted's 10 by 12 cabin. Again, very rustic, very simple, just wood cabin, no electricity, no running water, uh, with a green roof. Living in the woods, once you get adapted to that way of life, there's almost no such thing as boredom. You know, you can, you can sit for a while and just be, at, for hours, you can just sit and do nothing and be at peace. It's a bit haunting every time I come back here. I've never felt peaceful. So, I mean, we're surrounded by beautiful trees and the birds are chirping, but I have never, I would never use that word to describe how I feel in this spot. Not, not peaceful. You know, a lot of people that have perpetrated a single murder uh, regret it for the rest of their life and, and will never kill again. What makes the serial killer so particularly fascinating is they've gone through the trauma of killing someone and are addicted to it and are ready to do it again and again and again. I mean, if you're going to choose an enemy, it's, it's, the, it's the head of a corporation who's a much bigger enemy than scientists they're developing genetic, genetic engineering and that sort of thing. And I think it's important not to forget that, that it's, it's really the, the core of the system that we have to worry about most.
the investigators are picking up that this is an anarchist who doesn't like environmental decimation, doesn't like people who, who shill for anti-environmentalist causes. Investigators say it was a package sent through the mail about the size of a home video cassette. It killed 50-year-old Thomas Mosser, a senior advertising executive at one of the largest ad agencies in the world. He opens it in his kitchen where his wife and uh, young daughter had been standing next to him just moments before. Uh, and he's killed uh, instantly by the very significant blast at this point. We are all today determined to end the death and destruction that these random bombings have wrought. The pressure to solve it is immense. Desperate is perhaps a, a fair word at that point. Unibomb hotline. So far, thousands of tips phoned into the San Francisco Unibomb Task Force have led nowhere, and a $1 million reward hasn't helped either. The phones are ringing constantly. We are getting thousands of calls from the public. We don't watch TV much. Um, the first time I ever heard the term Unabomber was in December of 1994, when um, the front page of our newspaper said that the Unabomber, whoever that was, had struck again and killed an advertising executive by the name of Thomas Moser in New Jersey. But I'd never heard the term before. Ted came down here once, didn't he? No. He, he never came here. No, I remember him once uh, planning to come. He even told me he had a bus ticket and that he was going to arrive on a certain day. And then he had decided not to come. And he said he had too much to do. And of course, I'm thinking, too much to do? I mean, come on, Ted. <laughs> what do you have to do? And of course, at that time, I didn't know how, what he meant. My brother's attitudes radically changed when he married. After he got married, his wife completely converted him to a, a conventional middle-class point of view. He and I had never met. I, I have still never met him. I have never, as far as I know, talked to him over the phone or anything like that. He didn't like me. He didn't want David to marry me. He was really furious, I guess, about the wedding. And of course, he didn't come. And uh, he wrote a letter that was very, very aggressive. Though it was really awful. I had never met the guy, and nobody could understand why Ted was threatening to break connection with Dave. Every time David and his mother got together, they sat there for hours talking about Ted. His mother was very worried about it because Ted had cut relationships to his mother. So that's how I began to pick up the sense that he was uh, unusual and perhaps mentally, you know, different. And... Linda was the first one to tell me, read, reading some of my brother's letters, hearing family conversation, she says, David, your brother's mentally ill. You know that, don't you? And I said, wait a second, you don't really understand him. He's a genius. He's different. He's blah, blah, blah. David, look at this. People who are healthy in their minds don't think like this.
technology. And that was one of the things that made me most hopeless um, because I assumed that the, the power of technology would just keep um, increasing and closing everything down. His basic argument is that technology is a system that we really cannot control. It's causing harm to people and the environment. The stresses will increase on humans and on nature. And there's no way to modify or to reform the system so as to avoid these negative outcomes. His, his conclusion is the system has to be brought to an end. We have to have a kind of revolution against the system and to stop it before it can uh, lead to these catastrophic outcomes. In 1985, the Unabomber sends another letter to the New York Times. It's three pages of single-space typewriting. It takes credit for the bombing of Thomas Mosier, and he is uh, indicating that this will continue unless there's now a, a deal that's being offered. The bomber says he'll desist from terrorist activities only if major publications print a manuscript advocating the destruction of the worldwide industrial system. He says the written document that he wants published will be coming forth shortly. The so-called Unabomber has now spoken out and taunted the FBI, calling it a joke. In the letter, he refers to the FBI as a joke. This is somewhat echoing sentiments that are coming from political and media and public circles. He apparently has jumped on that bandwagon as well. The mysterious Unabomber is claiming to be part of a group Quote, the FBI has tried to portray these bombings as the work of an isolated nut. We won't waste our time arguing about whether we are nuts, but we certainly are not isolated. He claims to be a group called FC, and he's always very clear to make sure that his bombs contain FC somewhere in there where the FC will be found, stamped onto a piece of metal or etched onto a piece of metal, in other words, intended to survive. The Unabomber suggested that part of his motivation had to do with concerns about the environment to try to portray himself as perhaps some sort of environmental crusader around the same time. There were environmental groups which advocated radical solutions to their concerns. So it was somewhat of a logical extension that he get the task force to consider that perhaps he was associated with groups like that. Because there was always this idea of FC and the Freedom Club. And I think that the feds believed that there were, were more people involved than Kaczynski himself. And so they were really interested in letting me in there and letting us talk freely so that they could gauge whether or not Kaczynski was uh, connected in any way to any of us in Earth First. Did you ever think of yourself as an Earth Firster? Not really. Really? As sort of a sympathizer is too weak a word, but sort of Earth Firster satellite. Earth First has been an organization from its beginning that has been dedicated to action. Everything from, you know, tree sitting and other types of monkey wrenching and had been under suspicion of, of being tied to radical environmental terrorism. I didn't want to subscribe to the Earth First Journal because I didn't want to call attention to myself. You know, if, if uh, something happened, a piece of logging equipment, I didn't want them to know who to look for. <laughs> but I did, I did pick up a copy of the journal and um, I saw a lot in it that I liked. Yeah, the 90s was a trip. Sort of had this slow progression of radicalism. And for me, I noticed it up at uh, 
the mountains east of town, and Earth Firsters were trying to protect this forest up there, which they did. And these Earth Firsters created a, a, a blockade to, to prevent loggers from coming in, and uh, they won. In the eyes of the Forest Service, this is destruction of government property, a federal offense. And some critics are even calling these protesters domestic terrorists. Don't move your truck. Shut your truck off, man. There's an old woman. She's 80 years old. 80 years old woman locked in the back of your truck. You will kill her. He's not turning it off. You know someone's locked under. There's an old woman. Discover Earth first, like in the late 80s, and said, hell, hey, these people are saying very much the same things that I've been thinking all along. So um, I was not inspired by Earth first. I just happened to agree with them. I thought a great deal. And then when Ted came along, or the Unabomber, and start, you know, killing people that were responsible for some of uh, this kind of behavior that these kids didn't like, uh, I think they found somebody that uh, they could respect a little bit and uh, could understand why he was doing it. FBI is investigating whether the Unabomber used this so-called ecological hit list to select some of his recent victims. The list, published in 1990 in an underground newsletter, is made up of 11 companies and organizations that the publisher of the paper apparently considered enemies of the environment. People in the anarchist community, they're, they're liking the, the philosophy that they're seeing reflected in this, killing innocent people people walking down lonely roads that's one thing killing people with a political philosophical bent this had resonance twenty minutes after two the calm of this sunny day in downtown sacramento is shattered it's a terrible terrible bombings let me take you somewhere it's hard to describe, really, the, the effects that such a thing has on a, a person, but it was, it was really awful. Um, I, I'll reserve saying any more for the sake of the victim and victim's families. But. Gilbert Murray, the president of the California Forestry Association, is the third person to be killed by the Unabomber. In it's the Unabomber. It's creepy, and it's current. And it's from a killer who has not been caught for more than a decade. Another kind of terror, mail bombs. Officials are warning everyone to be on guard. The most wanted criminal in America is still the Unabomber. You have to wonder, am I next? Is he going to send a, you know, a pipe bomb to the Chronicle? Because we're reflecting technology and capitalism and big business. I'm feeling every package, every parcel that comes in, you check for wires, check for a little bit of oil, you smell it. Has it a little, got, got a little gunpowder smell to it? You press down on it. Has it got uneven lumps that could be the match head igniters, could be explosive loads? Uh, you're very careful about packages like that. I think what has to be done is not to try to persuade the majority of people that were right so much as to try to increase tensions in society to the point where things start to break down, where people get uncomfortable enough so that they are going to rebel. Now the question is how do you increase those tensions? The newsroom gets a letter from the Unabomber saying that he's going to blow up an airliner in L.A. So we take this thing into the editorial office. Everyone looks at it. We're wondering what this next step is. Do you print this stuff? Are you going to be uh, an ad paper for a killer? We call the FBI. They come over. They look at it. It's pretty quickly determined that it's the real thing. Further examination has confirmed that this letter originates uh, from the Unabomber subject. So do you take him seriously? 
or do you blow it off? We decided to print. It was a suggestion by the uh, Postal Service to simply not carry packages anymore. They weren't willing to put them in airplanes. And that added tremendously to the already unbelievable amount of pressure on the task force to solve this case. You can't have the mail in the United States come to a halt. It's almost inconceivable. Los Angeles International Airport is under full alert with security measures not seen since the Gulf War. And it turns out the guy wasn't serious. And so after the 4th of July weekend comes and goes and no one's killed, nothing blows up, uh, the dogs he had called off. Uh, and it goes back to Unabomber normal. Everybody in the United States, it seems, uh, and probably many other countries, is aware of and interested in the Unabomber and what comes next in this story. In uh, the summer of 1995, almost every day or every other day, there was a little article describing the Unabomber and what his interests were and these different theories about what we should do. We don't want, you know, any kind of technology. We don't want all of this. We have to go back to the natural way of life, you know, without machines and without phones and all of that. It was churning up in my head quite a bit. And I thought, gosh, that sounds like Dave's brother. I look at her, and she, she doesn't look quite happy. And I said, something wrong? And for a while, I was going to hold off. But then I did broach the topic. And she said, David, and I think it might be your brother. And you know, my immediate reaction was, oh, oh, I know it's not my brother. So thank goodness it's, you know, thank goodness it's just a worry you have, not something real. David just couldn't believe it. He just thought I was being stupid, I guess, or crazy or something. I mean, she really, it was more of an intuition, I thought, than anything, nothing like evidence. He didn't want to believe it. And I guess that's the way um, family members might be, that they don't, they don't want to believe that about their family member. These are typewritten copies, typed on the same typewriter that's been used on most of the other Unibomb communications, which we have figured out forensically is a very old L.C. Smith Corona manual typewriter. He sends as many copies of the manifesto as can be banged out using carbon paper on a manual typewriter. Five copies go out to various locations. We get a copy of the manifesto ourselves. And I read this thing word for word. We realize the guy's smart. He's not a great writer, but he's a very competent academic writer. And we now have the dilemma before us about whether we should print this manifesto or not. Do we want to piss off the author? Do we want to serve the greater good of journalism? Do we want to suppress it because it's incitive stuff that can rile up anarchists into action or just be smart stuff that informs the public. The leadership of the task force uh, was given the assignment by the FBI director and the attorney general, Director Free and Director Reno, to debate this question and come back with a recommendation. Within the bureau, there was a uh, thought that you know, are we capitulating to a bomber, uh, a terrorist, by publishing his manifesto? I'll call it somewhat furious debate over this, and everybody was not on the same side initially. And the decision was made that we shouldn't publish it. The meeting breaks up. One of us looked at everybody else and said, that was the wrong decision. And everybody else in there said, yes, that was the wrong decision. And the primary argument was, if it gets published, a document of that size seen by enough people, it's almost impossible someone will not recognize the author, either because of the way he writes or because of his message. We figure this is for the greater good. You put out the clues 
And as a newspaper, we are all about being for the greater good. So in conjunction with the F local FBI office, we printed a manifesto. It was behind the business pages, tucked in between the want ads, but it was all there today, all 35,000 words of the Unabomber's message to America. We print the thing and we get zillions of responses at the time. I think that copy of the paper sold fairly well, which, you know, you don't want to make money on horror, but the fact that it sold well meant that a lot of people were reading it, and that was good. You want people to, to pick it over. I remember my first thought was that the Unabomber had won at this point. When the whole thing was published, I thought, well, that's it. He won. He, he defeated the, uh, the federal government and the FBI because he got this thing published. This is the original copy of the Unabomber Manifesto. I kept it, never knowing that I would meet the author. It's huge. It's an amazing document. I, the opening sentence, the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. They have destabilized society, have made life unfulfilling, have subjected human beings to indignities, have led to widespread psychological suffering, and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. Science marches on blindly without regard to the welfare of the human race. The system cannot be reformed in such a way as to reconcile freedom with technology. The only way out is to dispense with the industrial technological system altogether. It would be better to dump the whole stinking system and take the consequences. We therefore advocate a revolution against the industrial system. Well, the problem with the revolutionary should be, it seems to me, is unequivocally simply to get rid of the industrial system. I and mean, that's the key point. That's my take on the situation. You can take any aspect of the technological system, and it's hard to argue against any one aspect. You could say, what's wrong with a phone? What's wrong with an email? What, right? What's wrong with a digital camera or something? But if you take someone like Kaczynski, he looks at the ensemble, the whole system, and he says, well, look what the system is doing to us. It's drawing people in. They're getting addicted. Mental stress is increasing. Mental illness is increasing. Physical health is decreasing. Environmental destruction is accelerating. This is a consequence of the whole technological system. It's not any one technology. So my cell phone isn't destroying the, the global ecosystem. No, it's not the cell phone, but it's the whole network that goes to having and creating and using a cell phone on a mass basis. That's what's destroying the global ecosystem, and that's what's causing human stress. When friends of mine discovered that I hadn't even read it yet, they go, you're going to love it. Read it. You're an idiot. Come on. And I did. I, there wasn't anything I disagreed with, actually, and I still... Uh, advocate it. I, I think it's just an amazingly important document now more than ever. I think we have to build a strong and cohesive revolutionary movement so that when the right moment comes, we will be prepared to do what we have to do. In order to get our message before the public with some chance of making a lasting impression, we've had to kill people. It comes right out and says it. The Justice Department hopes to use his own words to lead investigators to one of the most hunted men in the country. I'm sure that there will be a lot of people in the academic community that will read this and will say, well, that sounds just like, and they'll flash back to a student or a professor that they have worked with. It did ultimately lead to literally thousands of people that thought that they might know who the Unabomber was. And this was getting to be about mid-October. David promised that when the Unabomber Manifesto was published that he would go out and get it. He promised that to me. But uh, apparently there were only six copies being sold at this newspaper shop, and it, they had already gone very quickly. The college library had the issue, but somebody had taken the manifesto out of it, so it wasn't there, and I'm, I'm ready to throw up my hands. And, she, she, and then she says, the Internet. I had heard, hardly heard of the internet 
We didn't have it at home, but they had it at the college library. Linda's sitting next to me. And first of all, it's kind of weird. Here I am in this newfangled technology trying to figure out if my brother is the anti-technology terrorist. You know, I felt almost like guilty about doing that. He was l looking at the screen and I was looking at his cheek and his jaw dropped when he read the first few lines of the Unabomber Manifesto. Linda kind of whispered, David, what do you think? Do you think it could be Ted? And I said, I have to admit, some parts of it really do sound like him. If I had to, if I had to guess, maybe there's one chance in a thousand he wrote it. And I was expecting, well, maybe that would be reassuring to her. But she said, David, one chance in a thousand? That's not nothing. I started to try and talk Dave into getting an expert in analyzing the comparison between Ted's letters and the Unabomber Manifesto, that, that perhaps there's a pattern because it's the same author. So I suggested Susan Swanson, who I knew was a private investigator and had connections with this kind of thing. I've known Linda since we were toddlers. It was Linda who cracked the Unabomber case. She was the only one who suspected just by reading his letters that he might be violent. And I tried to look to see if there were any similarities. And after a while, there were times when I thought they really could have been written by the same person. I've got to know that every last tie joining me to this stinking family has been cut forever. It would be better to dump the whole stinking system and take the consequences. I thought it was hard to tell the difference between the two. It kind of flowed. It had, you know, um, the same tone. So I went to work researching the Unabomber case, taking into account other things Ted had that were in common with the Unabomber. Probably the biggest geographic link had to do with universities where bombs were found. There were two at the University of California at Berkeley and one at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And we knew that Ted had gotten his PhD at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and we knew he had been a pro assistant professor at the University of California at Berkeley. We were looking at the timeline of the bombings and letters that we had received from Ted. My big hope was that we would find that a letter was sent from Montana on a day that, say, a bomb was sent from California. So I was still hopeful that he might be ruled out. And um, what David knew is that Ted would sometimes hitch a ride to Helena, Montana. And from there, he would catch a Greyhound bus all the way to the San Francisco Bay Area. I made some calls to the Greyhound bus line. They said, there's no way you could take the Greyhound bus from Helena, Montana to San Francisco, California without going through Salt Lake City, Utah. And since Salt Lake City is one of the places where a bomb had gone off, that was very concerning. I'm actually thinking my brother could be the most wanted person in America, a serial murderer. The cost, if we were wrong either way, was so intense. If we did nothing, and Ted was the Unabomber, he might strike again, someone would be dead. We'd have to go through the rest of our lives understanding that somebody died because we had failed to act. That was intolerable. And then the other side of this was the realization, my God, if Ted is, if Ted is guilty and he's killed three people, and he's probably going to get the death penalty. How, what would it be like for me to go through the rest of my life with my brother's blood on my hands, the brother I'd sworn never to abandon? Man, that was unthinkable. It was like I was sort of in this box, not at all of my own making, and there was like no way to get out of it. For me, it was easy. There was a possibility, uh, was somewhat a pretty decent possibility, that he was the Unabomber. So we had to do something. So 
David called me, and he said, you know, that this was, this was bad news. I said, well, we think we need to stop the violence, so we'd like you to contact the FBI. We thought, everything's going to change, you know, everything's going to, well, two or three weeks go by, we don't hear anything. We are deluged with information. People are mailing in writings from their uncles, their brothers, their ex-boyfriends, saying, well, this person might be the Unabomber. Um, and we're trying to take it in and process it. There were thousands of people who got brief looks. There were 2,417 people who were designated formally as suspects. Ted Kaczynski was number 2,416. But at this point, my mother got sick. She was in the hospital in Chicago. I had to fly back there, and I found myself alone in her house. And um, I realized she had saved a bunch of letters from my brother. And among her letters, I find a 23-page manuscript, which was like, I guess you'd call it a proto-manifesto. It was the essence of the manifesto boiled down to 23 pages written maybe several years earlier. And at that point, without hesitation, we contacted the FBI. A call came in to the switchboard at the San Francisco office looking for someone from the Unabom task force. It was from an agent, and she's read the document, and she thinks it might be important. All she wanted is someone on the task force to look at the document before it just went into the great pile of, okay, this has been handled and washed out. So I asked her to send it to me. She faxed it to me. I looked at it, uh, and I concluded that the writer of this 23-page document and the writer of the manifesto were the same person. This is a huge moment. The light is at the end of the tunnel. We are going to solve this case. We are convinced of it. But we don't have enough evidence to arrest him. We can tie him very definitively to the manifesto, but it's ties based on linguistic analysis, essentially. That's not enough to arrest him. We need to get into that cabin. We need to conduct a search of that cabin and see what's in there. That becomes the primary goal, is getting into the cabin by search warrant. We send a handful of agents up there. They approached my dad because Ted trusted him. I mean, as much as he probably trusted anybody, because he'd been his neighbor for 20 plus years. They were like, what do you know about your neighbor, Ted? And Butch is like, he's a hermit. <laughs> And they go, well, we're pretty sure he's the Unabomber. And Butch is like, no, he's not the Unabomber. And he's like, yeah, we, we're pretty sure we got him. And so would you be willing to help us in his arrest? And Butch is like, well, what do you need? <laughs> well, my dad was asked to video the terrain around Ted's place. And he went out there and took his video camera, held it down by his hip, and just walked the grounds so that the FBI could have a clear vision of what the terrain looked like around Ted's cabin. My dad, Butch, was the, the eyes and the ears of the operation. We start getting hints before April that the investigators are narrowing in, that the, that the manifesto has lit a fuse and that something's going down. And so we're scratching everywhere we can. We get clues. Uh, some of the networks get clues. They're trying to keep a tight lid on it, but it's leaking out. The task force was contacted by CBS at the beginning of April. And CBS News indicated that they essentially had the story, and they were going to run with the story. We couldn't afford for media trucks to be driving down that little dirt road and knock on his door for a million reasons. So 
Okay, we had 24 hours to get in place. We flew uh, a plane load of agents, the entire San Francisco SWAT team to surround the cabin, crawl into place during the night, and then all the other people we would need to knock on his door the next day. The day of the arrest is early, it's kind of chilly. Wind was blowing. The air was so, I mean, the tension was so thick, you could just feel it. We didn't want to have a situation where we had a barricaded gunman. We knew Ted had uh, at least one weapon, uh, a rifle. Here's exactly what happened. Um, I was in my cabin about the middle of the day on April 3rd, and I heard a voice up on the hillside calling, is anybody home? And there were, there were three guys walking down the hill toward my cabin. They certainly were, did not look like the kind of people that I would thought FBI agents would have been. Two of them were old guys. One of them was, you know, fat with a big paunch, you know. I always thought FBI agents would be, you know, youngish men in business suits with ties and all that stuff. And these guys were dressed like, uh, you know, people were doing a geological survey for mining purposes. They, they said, we're from the Nordic Drilling Company. And then I just sort of started thinking there was something funny about these guys. Because he didn't, as I, as I started to, 